Moving um, over to the other vows, I'll ask John Neal to come up. He's our uh, senior uh, interventional fellow who has a lot of experience in structural interventions, particularly in the mitral space, and took the lead on our program working on uh, CT fluorofusion to optimize transeptal punctures. So John? Um, well, it's an honor to be here today and uh, be a little out of my depth with some of the esteemed faculty we have today and this weekend, but um, I will uh, do my best to measure up to that. Um, so like you said, I'm John Neal. I'm one of the interventional fellows here. Um, so I'm just going to do a case. It won't be quite as much hard research as Moritz's presentation, but um, hopefully still be uh, educational. So our patient in this case was a 54-year-old female um, admitted with NYHA class 4 symptoms who had had uh, recurrent admissions over the past four months. Um, she, of note, had a prior history of mitral valve and tricuspid valve repair nine years ago. Um, had done well with this, um, but then had, had to have a coronary artery bypass three years prior and additionally had comorbidities of end-stage renal disease and lupus as well as severe pulmonary hypertension. Um, so at the time for valve repair, uh, she was noted to have leaflet atrophy of the mitral valve as well as um, severe annular dilatation. And this was felt to be, of her tricuspid valve, this was felt to be secondary to her uh, lupus. Um, so as Morris mentioned, it's very important to know the prior surgical details because uh, that plays a lot into procedural planning as well as feasibility of a lot of these procedures. Um, so. The patient in this case had a 29 millimeter uh, tune flexible ring, annuloplasty ring in the mitral position, as well as a 29 millimeter simulus medtronic adjustable ring in the tricuspid position. Um, important to note that, um, you know, flexible rings uh, present certain complications as they don't provide quite as much rigidity for um, counter pressure against your valves to hold them in with kind of the radial force of the ring. Um, so upon admission, this particular time, this patient had, uh, was noted to be basically volume overloaded with evidence of both right and left-sided uh, heart failure symptoms with severe edema as well as uh, rouse and um, uh, positive hepatojugular reflux. So on our echo, for those of you that are um, familiar with echo, uh, you'll note that there is a pretty significant thickening and calcification of the annulus, um, as well as a prominent um, diastolic flow acceleration through the valve. And that uh, is consistent with the gradient of around 18 that we saw on CW. Um, so pretty significant gradient. It was actually measured at higher at various times during prior admissions, up in the mid-20s at times. Um, also noted to have severe annular enlargement with as you'll note here, very poor coaptation of the tricuspid leaflets and moderate to severe TR. So the question is what to do next. So we have a very, as we noted, very comorbid patient with uh, end-stage renal disease, lupus, severe pulmonary hypertension, um, RV dis and result in RV dysfunction, uh, two prior sternotomies, so obviously at very high risk for another third sternotomy, um, but with multivalve dysfunction. Um, and all this was in spite of pretty aggressive volume removal with hemodialysis. So ultimately, um, after much consideration and hand wringing, a uh, decision was made to bring the patient to the hybrid OR and attempt a uh, simultaneous valve and ring in both the mitral and tricuspid position, uh, an attempt to palliate some of her symptoms and hopefully uh, alleviate some of these recurrent hospitalizations. So here is the periprocedural TE. Again, you'll just note how severely thickened these valve leaflets are. Um, and also, another thing to note is some of the difficulties of intraprocedural tricuspid imaging. Um, sometimes we can get good pictures with TE, but remember that the tricuspid is a very anterior structure, and especially with a lot of prosthetic material or calcification, it can sometimes be very difficult to get good, clear images of, as anybody that's done tricuspid imaging has seen or anybody that's done TE, period. Um, here's just a 3D re uh, reconstruction uh, showing just a very limited diastolic orifice area. 
So um, as noted, the patient was taken to the OR, um, started with a, a preface sheath and a bayless needle to do the transeptal, um, advance the amplat super stiff into the left atrium. Um, and then changed out for an Agilis steerable catheter, uh, just a common steerable catheter we use to um, navigate the left atrium. Uh, used this to advance a J wire across the mitral valve. Um, after this, the uh, pigtail was advanced into the uh, LV through the mitral valve for hemodynamics and was confirming, again, severe mitral stenosis. Um, it was switched out for safari wire for better support, um, which is just an atraumatic wire with the coil at the end. I'll have a picture of it in just a second. Um, so we'll go to the intervention. Fluoroscopy. So here you can see, unfortunately, we didn't capture the fluoroscopy of the valve release itself, but just positioning. Um, so some important notes. You don't want to go too atrial and not have enough purchase to anchor your valve in place um, and then result in, you don't want to end up with left atrial ejection or um, <clears throat> If you end up too ventricular, you can have a separate set of problems where you basically obliterate your LVOT and result in a whole separate set of issues. Um, but in this case, uh, the valve was deployed under rapid ventricular pacing um, just to stabilize the position uh, deployed here. And here you see the post-procedural pictures showing no residual MR and um, hemodynamics confirmed a good gradient afterwards. And we'll show you some post-procedural imaging in just a second. Um, next, we turned our attention to the uh, tricuspid valve and um, pulled back our, our sheath across the uh, atrial septum and switched out back for the agilis to, again, provide us a little bit better maneuverability. And we're able to use this in a pigtail catheter to advance our supply wire into the distal pulmonary artery to provide a rail. Um, and again, here you'll see the the safari wire out through the RVOT into the right pulmonary artery, providing a good support. You'll note here the pacemaker lead had to be pulled back um, due to the fact that we don't want to trap a pacemaker lead because <laughs> that would be not ideal. Um, so this had to actually be done without rapid ventricular pacing. Um, so we use, you'll note, kind of the slow deployment of the valve to ensure that it's in appropriate position and. Um, very stable throughout the course of the deployment. Um, and then again here you'll see post-procedural imaging showing no residual tricuspid regurgitation and uh, good forward flow. You'll also note again, the, as noted but prior to the exam, pretty poor RV function. Um, and this is just kind of a post-procedural fluoroscopy showing the kind of double barrel valves that we are able to get into position. And here's a post-procedural 3D reconstruction showing uh, obviously much improved diastolic orifice area from the pre-procedural imaging you saw, as well as uh, hemodynamics to, consistent with that, with the improvement of the gradient from, like I said, high teens, low 20s to um, five post-procedure. So pretty good result in the mitral side. And you saw the results as far as the tricuspid regurgitation. Um, so in conclusion, in multivalvular disease, previously when taken to the OR, we expect the full um, you know, replacement and repair of all uh, relevant valves. Um, this becomes a little bit more complicated in very comorbid patients where they're at very high surgical risk for multivalve intervention or multivalve surgery. Um, so it presents a complicated management decision of do we proceed with one valve at a time? Do we stage the second valve? Do we just go ahead and try and fix everything like we would with a surgical procedure? Um, so that provides a lot of management decisions that you have to really take the patient and, and anatomy into account. Um, but that being said, valve and ring procedures are feasible, though they can be technically challenging. Have, again, very important to take into account what the prior surgery was, what sort of um, valvuloplasty ring was used, um, or as Moritz uh, pointed out very well, what uh, mitral prosthesis was used. Um, again, it's very relevant as far as what is flexible, what is stiff, um, you know, what is the shape, because ultimately with a lot of these procedures replacing a, you know, a square peg and a round hole or round peg and an oval hole, um, it can lead to a lot of 
other types of complications such as paravalvular leak um, or <coughs> um, persistent stenosis due to deformation of the valve ring. Um, that being said, uh, transcatheter mitral valve and ring has been shown to be feasible in large registry studies. Um, in one particular registry of about 140 valve and rings, 83% um, had a successful valve implantation after one device with an average post-procedural gradient in those particular patients of 6.4. Um, and of note, very low rates of death in emergent reoperation at less than 2% uh, death and um, less than 5% emergent reoperation. So again, those are, for a very high risk population, uh, pretty good numbers. Um, in tricuspid valve and ring, on the other hand, um, in 91% of cases, they were able to get a valve in place. And in those particular cases, um, all 20 that had a successful valve implant um, had no residual, or mild or less residual TR at 12 months. So again, if you can get a valve in, you can get very good results with this and is an option for a lot of or maybe even the only option for a lot of these very high-risk surgical patients. Um, and stand, you know, it remains to be seen whether this can kind of be expanded to a lower-risk population in the future. Um, so that's all I have for you today. Um, any questions about any of that? No, I think that that was a great case and illustrates, um, you know, given the the rapid uh, development of this technology, some of the past challenges are becoming much easier to manage. Just one thing to point out, though, that valve and ring is off-label, technically. Um, and we do go through um, the uh, Edwards Medical Affairs to get approval to do these cases before uh, we do them, as opposed to, to valve and valve. But thanks, John. That was excellent. <clears throat>